Cool. So, okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk, The Little Board That Wasn't, an operator's apology. Um, yeah, it's the last lot of the day, and it's Sunday, so thanks to everyone who is still in this room. <laughs> um, right. Um, so since we are just three people, I st I'll still ask, um, what, according to you, or who do you think an operator is? Does somebody want to uh, tell me who you think an operator is? Not many people in this room. Come on. <laughs> Sorry? That's a good one. <laughs> um, so I'll see you up, yeah? And who do you think an operator is? <laughs> no problem. You want to take a guess? OK, by operator, I mean, well, each one of us is an operator. You're holding a mobile device, and you're here. So, And yeah, every one of us is an operator. And I mean this from the sense of uh, anyone who interacts with a device or a computer is an operator. So what's this apology about? Um, by apology, I mean uh, a defense of or a justification of what I do as an operator or what we do as, an op as operators. So it's 2017. We live in an age of present shock. Um, software is eating the world along with data. So do I really need to apologize? Yes, because nobody does this like I do. So about myself, um, I'm an amateur runner. Uh, my favorite running track is from the from St. Pauli to Schleswig-Holstein border uh, in Hamburg. Um, the distance comes about comes around to be 24 miles, but and but I still love that more than a marathon. I call it an Elbathon. Um, it's really nice if you're in Hamburg. Try it. I'm also a data visualization dilettante. Um, I was one of the last stage uh, proofreaders for Dr. or Professor Alberto Cairo's book on data visualization called The Truthful Art. My name is in the acknowledgment, so at least I qualify as a dilettante. And of course, I'm at FrostCon. So uh, I've been an open source author and contributor for the last seven years. Um, one of the projects I wrote myself is OpSpot. That's partly what my talk is about. Um, I've written many Puppet modules. Um, and I also, M Collective was one of my favorite pieces of software. It still is. I've written a bunch of integrations and modules for M Collective as well. Uh, Riemann is a monitoring system. I wrote the HBase client for Riemann. And I also wrote a Logstash plugin for transport. And um, last year, I was involved with uh, Perl.org uh, as a member of the Network Operations Center. Uh, and a lot of document, documentation contributions I've done for various projects. These days, I work as a systems engineer. And I work at Smarto. Um, and these are some of the technologies that we work with. Uh, we, have, we, we are primarily um, using Amazon Web Services for all of our infrastructure. Um, we run Apache and Apache Tomcat. Uh, we heavily use Python. Uh, our monitoring and metric system is based on Graphite as well as Datadog. So I want to express a portrait of an operator as a systems engineer. Um, but before I get on with that, I want to thank Froscon for giving me this opportunity to speak about uh, being an operator. Um, so um, last year, I read this article from the Login magazine about the death of system administration. And that triggered some thoughts in me, which um, I wasn't sure how I'd deal with the, what the article was trying to say. Um, so first, I want to put forth a justification or a defense of being a system administrator. Now, coming back to who an operator is, one thing I forgot mentioning was that Anybody at a supermarket, or more specifically, cashiers at the supermarket, 
Um, all of you interact with them pretty much every day. Uh, they are the ones who uh, ring up your groceries and uh, bill you. So they are also operators. And what they do is not really interesting, but the kind of operators that I really love are the ones who still do their jobs as if their life depended on it, or they really love just doing it. Uh, like, there's a difference between cashiers who just take your groceries from the conveyor uh, belt and quickly carry it into the collection area as soon as they can, like in one swoop. Uh, there are some who wait for you to collect each of your groceries, put them in your bag, and then you move. I like the second category of operators more. All I'm trying to say is that system administration isn't exactly um, something that rock stars would like, for example, but it's still a good job. <laughs> um, so I, my argument is that system administration is not dead, but some of the drudgery has moved. Uh, for example, somebody still has to install graphite. Now, I don't mean this in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way to offend the graphite community. I really mean that installing graphite is still something somebody has to look into and spend time on. Um, but that's changed, right? Now you write Puppet modules to install stuff. So you write a Puppet module to install graphite. Somebody still has to deal with service initialization scripts, and not just init scripts now. You have thousands of service supervision, super service um, handling software. So init, upstart, systemd, uh, daemon tools. And of course, who is handling DNS at your company? Somebody is. Well, thank him. He's your system administrator. Somebody still has to upgrade the operating system, write cron jobs, don't forget them. You get called for these things uh, by the C level, and turns out it's just a cron job which misfired or did not run properly. And yeah, who wrote that? Um, no, but most of the times cron jobs work. So <laughs> um, somebody still has to, has to go through all the change logs of all the software that you're responsible for, that you're running. Um, somebody still has to check the release notes find and use undocumented features, and go through bug trackers, GitHub issues, pull requests, batches, just to make sure your system's up and running. Somebody still has to subscribe to mailing lists. They're a thing, and sometimes you get good responses. IRC, of course. Um, you still have to hop on to IRC every now and then. And of course, somebody has to still restart the damn service. Um, and it's OK. Except it's not. I love this stuff. I still love it. Um, because all that anyone really asks for is a chance to work with pride. And system administration is as respectful a job as any other. But there's more to it. So back to the portrait of an operator as a systems engineer. Let's get on to some other things that a systems engineer today is supposed to do. So monitoring for bread and cheese. Um, I like what the authors of DevOps Handbook have to say about this, that the systems that we have to operate today are so complex that not a single, pers not a single person cannot understand the whole system completely. It's a worthy goal to do that, to try to understand how everything in your infrastructure works, but you still need your team and uh, you know, you can't be a rock star. You need your band to make good music. Um, so monitoring is one of those things. Like You need to interact with other members of your team, of other teams, to really figure out what needs to be monitored, how, how the monitoring is essential for running a business, and so on. So it's more than just uptime. Monitoring can reveal issues in software design and logic. Um, it's an information gold mine, but only if you're collecting all the right metrics. Otherwise, it's a coal mine. For example, now Tomcat is a web server for Java applications, and it exposes metrics about threads. Um, now, 
most people would think about just the threads which are currently busy, like busy threads. Like that's what governs the load on a system or that governs the scalability of your application, but that's not true. The real metric that does need to be used are the threads in service state, and those are the ones which actually um, describe the concurrency of your system. So small differences like these matter a lot um, for performance, for capacity planning, and just general understanding of the system. Uh, in this regard, I really like JMX, uh, which, is the, uh, which is Java monitoring extensions. Um, Tomcat is another example, is an example of, uh, of an application which uh, implements JMX very nicely uh, with all the relevant metrics that you might need. Um, compare this with some of the Python projects out there, like I spend quite a few evenings just trying to find the right Python libraries to uh, instrument a very a sample piece of code, and I couldn't find too many um, or too many well-maintained Python libraries. But I think it's changing, so all we can fix it. Um, monitoring is also a creative way of thinking. Um, another example I came across in the DevOps handbook was. Um, a pattern called cluster immune system. Um, so a cluster immune system uh, uh, of deployments means that um, your monitoring is an integral part of the whole software delivery pipeline. So, uh, it, so let's say you do a release of your application and the latency is higher by 50 milliseconds. In a cluster immune system pattern of deployments, that would be considered uh, a deviation, and uh, you would be essentially roll back. Um, so that's one. Uh, the other thing is, in cloud environments specifically, there are many ways uh, you can look at monitoring, and so it's a creative exercise to pick a good way of doing it. Um, dashboards, I'm sure everyone uh, who uses Graphite or any modern monitoring system use dashboards. Uh, I really like the next uh, generation of dashboards, which are simply notebooks. Uh, um, it can be, they can be very useful for uh, quickly validating some, uh, something that you anticipate or expect to work in a certain way, like one service causing latency in another service, you can quickly uh, create a notebook for that sort of thing, correlate a few metrics. Not the best way to do that for time series data, but it's still good, good for quick validation. I really uh, agree with, uh, or I echo what Theos Klosnagel uh, talks about in his book, Web Operations that uh, operation decisions must be results of online uh, algorithms, not just offline ones, which basically means that you can't look at it like, okay, um, let's collect everything we know about a certain thing and let's spend a few days or weeks to uh, uh, think about, uh, uh, let's say the monitor performance of a system or why that application was behaving a certain way three weeks back. So you have to be constantly thinking about uh, your platform, your infrastructure, your applications to make the right decisions at the right time. Especially in case of outages or incidents, you don't have that luxury. You need to act and you need to act now. So a good monitoring uh, is essential for running smooth operations. Which um, takes me to the point of alert fatigue. Like in all your enthusiasm, you did add all the monitors or a lot for, for all of your services. And in two weeks, your email is flooded with 1,000 or 2,000 messages. And you are then in a state of alert fatigue. Now, 
the problem with that is it's easy to get uh, comfortable with that. After a while, when you perceive that nobody is uh, looking at it, then who cares, right? And this also um, uh, is an example of static, static patterns of thought. Has anyone read Robert Pirsig here? Uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance or the Metaphysics of Quality. So he talks about static versus dynamic patterns of thinking. And I think cloud environments are a very good example of, it's a, it's a good example where you need to have uh, dynamic patterns of thinking to make the right decisions and do the right thing. And data, of course. Without data, you're just a person with an opinion. So all the metrics that you have collected, what do they mean? How do you make sense out of all that? So, so you, you do need different lenses to look at your data. Uh, lens of queuing theory, for example, for all your performance and capacity planning requirements. That's one lens that you will need to use. Statistics, big data science. Um, there are startups nowadays which aim to solve some of these issues, but even they can't answer all the questions without active involvement from operators. So it's, you still have to spend time to think about these things. I'm not there yet myself, but I know enough to be dangerous. Now, sometimes monitoring is funny and profitable. Um, just a question, do you guys have multiple metrics or monitoring systems? Cool. Now, sorry, so which ones do you have? Um, oh, OK. You? <laughs> So do you have like another monitoring system? Oh, cool. OK, so in our, in our setup, we have uh, two monitoring systems. One is Datadog. The other is monitoring slash metrics. I mean, one is Datadog, and the other one is uh, Grafana with Graphite. Now, uh, our whole department and the company, we the engineering teams used to think about, well, why do we need to? And I had the same response to it, like, you know, let's just use one of these. And uh, I personally was biased towards Datadog. Um, but um, yeah, I want to speak more about that. So what happened was that um, I was supposed to present uh, uh, the feasibility of a toggle or a switch in one of our main applications which power our business platform um, to find the tipping point of that toggle in terms of the uh, load it puts on the system. And I was, I was specifically looking for a high CPU usage spike. I was relying on Datadog all the time because it had worked for me pretty much every time before that I had tested, uh, I had to test such things. And this time around, this was one of the big tests. Like after this, we were going to go production with that feature in the application. And I did this test about three times. And this affected business also. It wasn't like you know, this, uh, it was completely foolproof. So each time I was making, a, I was making, I was doing the test, um, there was some stress associated with it in terms of, well, you know, somebody from the sales office might just jump in and say, what, what are you doing? So I was working under that pressure. And I, I couldn't see that system CPU spike that I was expecting to see. Uh, now, this is where having a separate, a, another monitoring system helped me. Um, um, until then, I wasn't really a fan of Grafana. Um, nothing against the software, but uh, I think we were running a buggy version, and I don't like the default color palette. I think it really makes it hard to understand what's going on. But it literally saved me that day. Um, we collect uh, metrics in graphite at uh, one second resolution for 10 minutes, and so I could see that CPU spike. And yeah, that saved the day for me. So, well, uh, you know, monitoring is funny. Right, moving on to automation. 
uh, the duct tape of complex systems. Um, I think automation, if you look at job descriptions or if you just look at any news source which is talking about technology or what's changing or what's coming in the future, automation is a very important or a very common, commonly heard phrase. And everybody's thinking, well, the jobs are going gonna go away, or how this is gonna affect the economy. But I, uh, I couldn't put this better myself. Uh, David Mindel, he has written book, he has written a book uh, specifically on this. He talks about technologies uh, not directly, uh, not, not from the perspective of what I've been talking about, like systems engineering, system administration, but. Um, about uh, systems in aerospace or in deep sea, you know, things like that, like how automation in such systems affect the way operators work with those systems. But I think our case is not that different. Um, I would take the example of infrastructure automation. Um, does anyone of you use config management or uh, automation tools like CloudFormation or Terraform in AWS? Or okay, so um, it's very easy to create stacks of associated services with a few lines of code uh, using tools like CloudFormation, Terraform, Puppet. Um, it can make it really easy to bring up a whole business in a new region in a few hours. Does this mean that you eliminate the need for having operators? Or you know, can one single person do all of it? Or it doesn't. But it does need a change in Einstellung, uh, which is, I think, mindset, if I'm not wrong in German. Um, if you look at it in this way, that stacks become reusable components of your whole platform. You can do uh, releases more often. You can test new features more quickly. Um, this is how we did it. Uh, one of our core pieces of uh, application uh, in our data pipeline, we tested a couple of features, I think, in a matter of a few days by uh, creating cloud formation stacks for that each time we were testing a feature. So that was really fast. Um, updates, of course, have to be initiated and monitored by mo operators. Yes, you can automate a lot of monitoring itself, but still, somebody needs to initiate that update, and you do need operators. So coming back to what uh, David Mindel actually said that automation changes the type of human involvement and transforms it, but it does not eliminate it. Right. The next uh, thing that uh, systems engineers um, must think about is performance analysis. And Peter Denning, uh, he was one of the seminal figures in, he is one of the seminal figures in computer science. He was very instrumental in uh, making virtual memory what it is today or what it has been over the years. Um, and he wrote one, uh, one paper on performance modeling where he said that performance modeling is experimental computer science at, it best, at, at its best. And he was right. Uh, but performance analysis, it's also experimental computer science at its worst, based on how you're approaching it, what data you have to work with performance analysis in your setup. So I'll just speak about that in the cloud, um, because that's what I have most experience with. Uh, so the cloud makes it interesting, the whole thing of the, it makes it interesting. Um, you still need an, an understanding of capacity planning, even with all the flexibility and elasticity that cloud providers promise. Um, they also provide multiple uh, pricing models and idioms to experiment with. And you do need an understanding of performance analysis to make sense out of all those options. You can also mix and match concurrency paradigms in the cloud, like you can 
use serverless architectures along with conventional multi-threading and multi-processing techniques uh, for your application. The cloud actually makes it sometimes possible. It's not always possible to do the best performance analysis that you must do uh, because your cloud provider did not expose the right user level, user metrics. Uh, like this happened to me. Um, uh, I was looking for utilization metrics for uh, uh, storage volumes. And after a lot of discussions, uh, it, we found out that some of the user-facing metrics are not exactly representat representative of the uh, exact performance. Um, now this, this makes you believe that it's kind of a gray box when you're working with cloud providers, not completely a black box, but more like a gray box. Uh, this can affect the correctness of your performance models and uh, that can affect uh, your predictions for the resources that you might need in the future. Another thing uh, to think about is, uh, is your application ready for all these interesting options available to you? Uh, for example, concurrency in Python, if you're using the multi-threading module, uh, is limited. Uh, it's not real concurrency. It's limited by the global interpreter lock. Uh, there is a project which aims to get rid of it, um, uh, but you just need to be aware that you can't expect uh, full uh, concurrency uh, from your application if you're using a particular module in Python. Event-based concurrency is also hyped a lot uh, these days, or uh, has been for a few years. Um, but even that is limited to using one single core, the main listener thread. So that's also a limitation. Now, programming. Um, I'm sure everybody has heard of DevOps and how one of the most common things that uh, DevOps people talk about is that you need to learn, you need to know how to program as well as operate, which is fine, but this is not that. I'm gonna speak about programming in a different sense. So I think programming is basic literacy now, uh, or it should be. Uh, I think it's a prerequisite for modern existence because someone's an, someone else's algorithms and code is affecting our lives every day. And Karen gave the keynote on this subject uh, in a much, with, with far more uh, extreme consequences in her case when it's directly related to somebody's life. So cyborgs unite. Um, also as an administrator, you want your systems to behave nice, right? Uh, the application need not be a black box to you. Um, some tools that you can use for better visibility and understanding code paths in your application. Uh, one of the tools is flame graphs. Uh, I'll quickly show how, that, how a flame graph looks like. Um, so that's a flame graph of a Java application and Basically, you see all the code paths that are being uh, invoked from this application, and you can see which one is uh, sitting on CPU most, uh, is consuming most CPU, which one of these are Java libraries, which ones are system um, libraries and processes. So these sort of tools exist today, and uh, you can use them to better understand what the applications are doing from an administrative point of view. Of course, sometimes you must apply emergency patches uh, if you have to. For example, in the past, I think on a couple of occasions, I had to patch our production Puppet Master. And uh, yeah, you know, administrative software these days, well, it is code. and your uh, Python developer is probably not interested in fixing your Puppet Master, uh, the live Puppet Master. So, yeah, you must program. And lastly, about security. Um, I had 
actually uh, left out security completely when I was uh, when I first came up with the slides, but that obviously did not feel right for me. It was or it has always been that security must be part of any operator's thought process and. Um, it's not something that you look afterwards. It's something that's built, you built in your application or in your systems. Uh, obviously, that's not the case. Um, but yeah, for me, I never got uh, why somebody would not look at security from the beginning. So for me, it's, yeah, I, it's yeah, stranger than fiction. Uh, th the reason I... <laughs> There's one thing I wanted to say about security that my own initiation with computers was inspired a lot by fictional fic fiction on security uh, or networks, computers, uh, computer network security, and maybe that's why from the very beginning I was very uh, conscious of having a secure uh, having a secure environment for running applications and such. So, yeah. Now, what about the little bot that wasn't? Um, now, I really like this anecdote from Alan Turing's life that once he dreamed that he was a machine, and when he woke up, uh, he said, I don't know whether I'm Turing dreaming that I'm a machine or a machine dreaming that I'm Turing. And somewhat similar thoughts I had when I wrote a bot about five years ago. Um, I wrote it as a natural way for an operator to um, For, for an operator to um, get a sense of narrative as you're walking in, in, in as you're walking in an off, in your office what's the what's the most recent thing that happened what incidents went off uh, what issues do you need to work on so in that sense I wrote something known as opsbot which was a pluggable bot for operations teams with multiple sources of data and information like issue trackers monitoring systems and chat software Essentially, this was chat ops before it became what it's now. So I wrote that in um, May 2012, and this graph tells uh, you uh, the interest in the term chat ops over years. This is from Google. So, yeah, even though chat ops is past its sell by date, according to me, but I just want to let it out there that sometimes it's nice to have this sort of validation, right? Like artists and book authors die uh, without getting the recognition they deserved, and they don't even know that, okay, now they have millions of readers, but at least I can see from Google what's happening with chat ops now. So I'm not saying I was the first one. Of course, IRC has had bots since forever. Um, GitHub wrote their Hubot software around this time, I think six months or a year before I released mine. So, but yeah, still feels nice. Um, so what about the board that wasn't? This is all nice. Uh, now, has anybody read Saul Bellow's book, The Dangling Man? He talks about uh, a guy who tries to juggle between his uh, interest for scholarly inquiry, like literature and art, versus what he has to do to earn his bread and also eventually to work for the military. So he dangles between these um, uh, things. Um, and I've, I think it's sort of similar for operators today, like uh, based on you know, the number of jobs that do exist for programmers, systems, and system engineers for us. I feel I get a sense of the dangling operator, like, um, I was in a tough spot about two years, or one and a half years back when I had the best opportunity for myself as a system administrator, and this was uh, for a dream company. And I basically uh, uh, failed that. And that fall was much harder than the fall I had last week from my longboard on an empty street in Hamburg, and it took me quite a while to recover from that. So I really like this quote when it says that knowledge without experience can make you paranoid, and experience without knowledge can make you schizophrenic. I think that sort of really applies to operators, you know, uh, with the amount of technology these days. So what do you do then? Well, you just keep operating. You reinvent yourself, but you have to keep operating. 
easier said than easier said than done, of course. But you must believe that what you are doing is really important, uh, even if it's trying out a new Vim plugin to keep you excited about your favorite editor. Uh, you must do it. You can't stop. Um, but who's the enemy? Uh, the enemy is uh, resistance. Uh, Stephen Presswild, uh, that's his uh, uh, idea that resistance is um, the life-threatening force that uh, would prevent you from pursuing your creative uh, uh, call, um, you know. Uh, or the lizard brain, as Seth Godin calls it, like, you know, um, as humans, our brains have evolved over many years, and one part of our brain, the lizard brain, he calls it, it only wants to eat, and it only wants to, you know, survive and always running and, you know, competing against everyone else. Uh, that's an enemy. That's your enemy. Um, and the problem is, people who don't real or folks who don't realize that, and other lizard brains around you can also be your enemy. And the death instinct, which Thomas Merton has talked about, he's a theologian, and he calls it the death instinct when you don't want to believe in your faith. And for operators, your faith could be Unix, your faith could be Vim, your faith could be, um, yeah, any one of these things. So don't stop believing. What can you do then? Well, you reinvent if you have to, but keep operating. Uh, again, this is easier said than done, but uh, it's necessary. For, for example, um, two years back when I had that fall, when I missed my dream company, I really thought hard about what I had been doing for five years and if it was meaningful at all. And that's when I really um, thought about data visualization as a field, like, you know, Today, you need the lens of data visualization to make any sense of what you're doing. If you're a programmer, if you're a system administrator, no matter what you do, data visualization can be a very, or should be an integral part of your toolkit to really understand uh, what you're doing. It's being used across many industry verticals, and I think we should be at the forefront of that, um, given that we are the ones who work with these things all day. You can still make you can make it easy for yourself by having by uh, situated reinvention. I borrow this term from situated cognition, which says that you think about certain things in its particular social, cultural, or individual context. And so, in for us in computer science, um, I really like Peter Denning's uh, Great Principles of Computing, the book he gives a whole framework of how to look at computer science. And I think you can pick you know, a thing that really inspires you and reinvent yourself in that domain or in that field. Right, that was it. Um, I want to say thanks to a lot of people. This is especially to uh, make sure, Chris, that you're listening. Um, thanks for giving my American dream in Germany. Um, Andreas Rutten, uh, also a colleague, he introduced me to FrostCon, um, that should say FrostCon 2016, but yeah, he introduced me to FrostCon last year. Um, Dr. Neil Gunther for being a very patient mentor, uh, looking forward to uh, the data analysis um, training in September. Falak, my companion. Um, she is Falak for people. <laughs> um, Ali Pina for writing M, M Collective. Um, it's one of the it's one of the applications that really inspired me as a system administrator early on to actually think about programming. Uh, it's still, I think, one of the best pieces of software that any system administrator can make use of. I want to thank all the operators everywhere in the supermarkets and everybody who's developing, everybody who's an administrator but not lizards. If you're a lizard, and if, and if you're an operator, stop being that. Hamburg, I really love uh, Hamburg. Hamburg has been kind to me for the last one and a half years. And yeah, I hope to return some of that love back. And of course, my parents for the first computer in my small room in the cubby hole, um, without which I won't be standing here. And yeah, feel and dunk. Any questions? Can you show the 
Oh, um, material like in. Uh, uh, was it the flame graphs one or the book? Uh, oh yeah, um, I actually I think I did not mention it com correctly. Um, So the book is called The Truthful Art. Uh, it's actually one of the very important books that came out, I think, last year, uh, written by Professor Alberto Cairo. He teaches at the University of Miami, Florida. Um, yeah, I think I just quickly skimmed on the part where I said it's my name is in the acknowledgments. But yeah, this book is very important. Uh, he's an important figure in the whole field of data visualization. Um, and this is the sequel to his book called The Functional Art. You can also go for that before uh, going for this one. Um, yeah, it's a very nice book. Um, I actually got it the first or the second day I was in Hamburg, and it was, that was a, I, one of the best feelings ever. Um, yeah. All right then, thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Room. <laughs> uh, thanks to you guys.